What a song of delight in that city so bright We'll be wetted neath heaven's fair dome How the ransom will raise happy songs in his praise When all of God's singers get home When all of God's singers get home Where never a sorrow or heartache will come There'll be no, There'll be no place like heaven, my home when all of God's singers get home. As we sing here on earth, songs of sadness or mirth, tis a foretaste of rapture to come. But our joy can't compare with the glory up there, when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, where never a sorrow or heartache will come. There'll be no place like heaven, my home, when all of God's singers get home. Having overcome sin, hallelujah, amen, will be heard in that land or the foe. Every heart will be light and his face will be bright, when all of God's singers get home, when all of God's singers get home, where never a sorrow or heartaches will come, there'll be, no there'll be no place like heaven, my home, when all of God's singers get home. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away, fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away, fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away, fly away. Shadows of this life have grown. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. Like a bird from prison bars is blown. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away. Oh glory, I'll fly away, fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away, fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away, fly away, fly away To a land where joy shall never end I'll fly away, fly away, fly away I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory I'll fly away, fly away in the morning When I die, hallelujah, by and by I'll fly away, fly away sadness, all will be gladness, 
and we shall join that happy band. And there'll be no tears, no tears, no tears, no tears up there. Sorrow and pain will all have fallen. There'll be no tears, no tears, no tears, no tears up there. No tears in heaven will be known. Glory is waiting, waiting up yonder, where we shall spend an endless day. There with our Savior, we'll be forever, where no more sorrow can dismay. And there'll be no, no tears, no tears, no tears, no tears up there. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. And there'll be no, no tears, no tears, no tears, no tears up there. No tears in heaven will be known. Some morning yonder, we'll cease to ponder or things this life has brought to view. All will be clearer, loved ones be dearer, in heaven where all will be made clear. Thank you for everyone that is here tonight. If you want to be making your way in from the foyer, we'll have our devotional time, and uh, then we'll dismiss the Bible classes in just a few moments. Uh, but before all of that, we do want to uh, make a few announcements. We uh, want to remember our sister, Vernell Howard. Uh, she was admitted into the hospital this afternoon, and so we want to be sure to remember her in our prayers. Um, John Crum underwent uh, some outpatient surgery today, and he may be here tonight. I don't know. Uh, they had intended to be here, but either way, I know that they're on, they have come, they're on their way home, so they said that that went well. Um, Joe James is going to have some outpatient surgery tomorrow, so I want to be sure to remember him in our prayers, and uh, of course, many others. Uh, we do want to um, mention uh, some of our Good Samaritans met tonight before services to prepare, uh, to prepare bags and appreciation bags for any doctors and nurses, and if you're a doctor or a nurse, uh, Meredith wanted you to know there is a bag that you can pick up of appreciation over in the fellowship hall. So be sure to uh, make your way over there. Uh, the elders wanted to share with the congregation that Jimmy and Joyce Spivey have placed their membership here. And I think a lot of you probably know Jimmy and Joyce from quite, quite some time back. Um, also, John and Jordan Nelson and their son Jet met with the elders on Sunday. And um, John is a member of the church and Jordan is going to be studying some more about those things. So I know a lot of you have gotten to know them. Um, we do want to remember visitation team number three, the last name from I through P. Please stop by the table in the foyer. Also, our cards out in the foyer, uh, opportunity to write a note to our visitors for everyone. Don't forget about um, our men's uh, prayer, prayer meeting tomorrow morning at 630. And I know that's uh, something we'll look forward to in the morning. Uh, if you have requests or things you would like for us to pray about, please be sure to share those things. Uh, you can share them with uh, myself or with Ronnie. Um, if you can't be here for some reason. Tomorrow night, the young at heart, uh, the, the men and the women uh, are invited to go to Ray's Mill Pond at 6 o'clock uh, to eat. And for more information, you can see Beth or Martha about that. Also, this coming Sunday is our Senior Sunday. Uh, we're going to take a moment to uh, honor our high school graduating seniors this coming, this coming Sunday. And uh, the biggest part of that will be that we will be having a congregational potluck. I know it's been several months since we've had anything like that, so we're looking forward to that congregational potluck. Uh, there will be cakes that, that will be provided for dessert, so no desserts, please. Things you thought I would never say. Uh, but dessert will be provided and uh, in the form of those cakes, so you can bring other things, and we'll have a really good time. Uh, we'll, be share, we'll be sharing some videos that I know Rogers put together and uh, honoring our seniors in a special way this coming Sunday afternoon. There'll be tables that'll be set up as we traditionally do if you want to get them cards, things of that nature. Um, 
Also, don't forget about Yak. We'll have a meal together this Sunday night after, after our evening services. And Monday night teens will meet on Monday night, next Monday night, at Brian and Kate Leverett's home. Um, so several things. I'm sure there are others, but um, we're grateful that you're here tonight. We're going to ask Brother Michael Jackson if he would come and lead us in a word of opening prayer. And Wes failed to mention it, but if you want to go ahead and mark the invitation song after John's devotion, it's uh, number 384. Let's pray. Then, Father, we come to you thanking you for this day and all its many wonderful blessings. We especially come thanking you for this opportunity to be here this Wednesday evening to have this period of devotion and Bible study. We pray that we will be with the teachers that are here tonight, that they have a lesson prepared that can benefit each and every one of us, and that those of us in class, that we will listen with willing and open hearts and minds and be willing to discuss the things that are being taught. Be with, be with us as we depart from this place tonight, that you will take what we've learned, we can go and apply it in our lives, and we can be a shining light in the world. Pray that you be with all those that have been mentioned here this evening as, as being sick. Um, be with Vernell Howard. Um, again, be with Brother John Crum as he's recovering from surgery, and be with Joe James tomorrow with his surgery. Be with all those that are seeing after them, and, and we pray that their health will, they will maintain their health and recover and be, and be able to join their place back with us. Pray that you be with us and guide and guard our steps and forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Michael. First of all, let me just say that I'm a whole lot better song leader than I'm going to be a speaker. So y'all just kind of just bear with me for just a few minutes. <clears throat> In number 16... The most famous story of Aaron's rod begins with a few of the Levites becoming disgruntled about the extra authority given to Moses and Aaron. They said, you have gone too far. The whole community of Israel has been set apart by the Lord and he is with all of us. What right do you have to act as though you are greater than the rest of the Lord's people? In verses 28 through 33, the Lord caused the earth to open up and swallow these three men along with their families. However, rather than submit to the Lord, the other tribal leaders joined the revolt. According to Numbers 1641, the whole community, community began to mutter against Moses and Aaron saying, you have killed the Lord's people. To put an end to the unrest, the Lord God decided again to use Aaron's rod for another miracle. God commanded Moses to have the leaders of each tribe bring their rod or their staff to the meeting place. Each of the leaders were to have their name inscribed on the staff or rod, and the Lord told Moses, buds will sprout on the staff belonging to the man I choose. Then I will finally put an end to the people's murmuring and complaining against you, number 17, five. They left their rods before the Lord, and in the morning Aaron's, rods, Aaron's rod that represented the tribe of Levi sprouted budded, bloomed, and produced ripe almonds, a clear demonstration of God's power. This miracle made me think about how almonds are produced today. You see, today you can't have almonds unless you have the help of pollinators. In California, each year, 800,000 acres of almonds are pollinated by an estimated 1.3 million colonies of honeybees each year. Do you realize that one third of everything you eat is a direct result of pollinators? See, it could be honeybees, it could be bumblebees, it could be wasps, it could be butterflies. But without these pollinators, mankind is said to have less than four years to survive on this planet. <clears throat> the honeybee is a busy little insect, and in its short eight week life, it will only contribute a mere one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey to its colony. Honeybees, by instinct, spend their life pollinating, gathering nectar, condensing that nectar into honey. It is estimated that to produce just one pound of honey, the average colony of 20 to 60,000 bees must collectively visit millions of flowers and travel the equivalent of two times around the world. To make one pound of wax, bees must consume at least seven pounds of honey. But yet, I am amazed at how much honey they can actually store up. You see, on a good year, it could be gallons upon gallons upon gallons of it. 
Did you know the word honey is used 61 times in the Bible? That was fascinating to me. A lot of the times it has to do with abundance, and at times it describes as wisdom. In Psalms 24, 13 through 14, it says, eat, eat honey, my son, for it is good. Honey from the comb is sweet. Know also that wisdom is like honey for you. If you find it, there's a future for you and your hope will not be cut off. John 9, 4 says, I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. You know, an aeronautical engineer would say that a bee on account of its design is not able to fly, but it does. Every member of a honeybee colony has one main purpose, the preservation, the protection, and the propagation of the colony. You see, the queen, the worker, and the drone, they each play a significant role in the colony. I have often thought of the church when it comes to this aspect. You see, we all play an important role, and our goal is to preserve, to protect, and further the church. What a honeybee accomplishes through instinct, Christians must accomplish through faithfully carrying out God's word. Perhaps, like the bee, by design, the church shouldn't fly, but it has survived and grown over the last 2,000 years. You see, in defending the colony, the, bees give her, the bee gives her life, for many Christian martyrs have given the last measure of devotion to further their belief. In both cases, it is a total commitment to the goal that makes possible the health and safety of the colony. You see, it's the thing I see when I do this hobby that impresses me the most. Can I challenge you this week to do something? What do you see? You know, whether it's on the golf course or if you're on a walk, maybe a run, riding your bike, or maybe it's just sitting on your back porch watching hummingbirds fly. Can I challenge you to, to do what Psalms 46.10 says? Can I challenge you to be still and know who God is? You see, there are, there are times upon inspections of this colony when I run across the perfect frame and I'm just still. And I see God in a whole other light. <clears throat> Perhaps you're not a Christian tonight. You can become one if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You repent of your sins. Confess his name before me and we'll take you this very hour and baptize you for the remission of your sins. Perhaps you're a member of the church and you haven't been still long enough to see God. If you'll come forward tonight, we'll pray for you together as we stand, as we sing.
dismissed for class today. Amanda Mole wrote for The Atlantic in October of 2019, and the title of her article was How America Lost Dinner. And she talked about how our society has changed, and it's changed with longer commutes to and from work, roles changing in families, fast food companies that now can provide what they would say are healthier eating choices, and just on the whole, Americans don't get together anymore around the dinner table to eat together. And in her, art, in her article, she talks about some of the things that we've lost since we no longer come together as families to eat, along with eating at home being more cost efficient. There's also the social aspect, which is forfeited as we're separated from one another. There's no more getting around the table to talk about the things of the day or different struggles and hardships that different members of the family are facing. Everybody's in their own pockets doing their own things. And while Uber Eats and DoorDash may be convenient, they may be crippling our homes in certain ways that we haven't considered. In the first century, eating together was more than just a meal. There was a social aspect, a deeply social one, as individuals came together, not just for meals, but to learn deep lessons. At least 10 times in the Gospel of Luke, we have a picture of Jesus sharing meals with other individuals. And on every occasion, he makes it a point to teach them deep spiritual truths. It was at a meal where he was at Levi's house in Luke chapter 5 and verse 32 when he says, I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It was in Luke 9, 10 through 17, when he multiplied the five fish and the two, the five fish and the two loaves, and he fed the multitude. And he taught his disciples on that occasion that God can make much of our little. And it was their responsibility as leaders to see to the needs of the people. It was at a meal that Martha learned that Mary had chosen the better part that wouldn't be taken away from her. It was around the table that he said these words when he was at Zacchaeus' house. The Son of Man, Luke 19, 10, has come to seek and to save that which was lost in the Lord's Supper. And the two post-resurrection meals, first with those on the road to Emmaus, and then with his disciples in Luke 24, as he says near the end of the chapter, I've taken this food so that you know it's me, myself, and I'm not a spirit. I've really been resurrected from the dead in flesh and blood. All of those lessons Jesus taught as he was eating with other individuals. But there are three times specifically in Luke's gospel where Jesus sits down to eat a meal and he does so with the Pharisees. Now this may shock us because maybe we've created this paradigm in our mind where Jesus is sort of anti-Pharisee. But the truth is Jesus loved them, cared about them, saw their deep spiritual potential and wanted nothing more than for them to rid themselves of their self-righteous ways and come to know the way of truth. And so in Luke chapter 7, he's in Simon's house, and it's there that Simon learns this lesson. As Jesus tells him, those that have been forgiven a great debt by God have heaven's permission to show extravagant thankfulness. 
even if it makes the self-righteous uncomfortable. Simon learned that lesson as Jesus sat around his table. The second time we read of Jesus eating with the Pharisee, it's in Luke chapter 11, verses 37 down through 54, as there's one Pharisee who's more concerned with outward cleanliness and whether or not Jesus washes his hands than the condition of his heart. And Jesus says, there are more important things than physical cleanliness. I'm concerned about the individual soul. But if you have your Bible tonight, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 14. Because it's in Luke 14 that we find the last occasion in Luke's gospel where Jesus dines with the Pharisees. And when he does, Luke 14 and verse 1 says it's on the Sabbath day. Not only is it on the Sabbath, but they are watching him closely as they're zeroing in on Jesus to see what he will do. There's a man that they brought, it seems, to sort of tempt and test Jesus to see what he would do. The text says this man had what's called the dropsy. And they know that it's the Sabbath, and Jesus knows it's the Sabbath. And as has been the custom so far throughout the gospel accounts, they are waiting to see if Jesus would heal on the Sabbath day. And he tells them, basically, human life is more important than property. And he heals the man, and there's nothing they can do or say. Luke 14, 6 says, they didn't answer him anything. He wouldn't want to teach them about humility in verses 7 through 11, and how they should choose the lower seats and humble themselves, lest they exalt themselves and be demoted with shame and embarrassment. And then he shifts in verses 12 through 14 to say, welcome in individuals you normally wouldn't welcome into your company, the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you'll be paid at the resurrection of the just in verse 14. And then when he gets to verse 15, our text for tonight, he's sitting at the table with these men. In his last meal with the Pharisees, and he teaches them a lesson that challenges their hearts and their souls. He teaches them a lesson at this meal so that hopefully this would not be their last meal with him. Jesus is about to talk to them about a meal more important than any other meal that he had eaten in his life on earth or than they, that they ever would. And he wanted them to see the value and importance of seeking him as he truly was. The Pharisees checked all the boxes. They were from the right family. They were in the right place. They had the right book, but they weren't all that they should be. And in the heart of many of the Pharisees that Jesus encountered in the Gospels, there was this heartbeat of self-arrogance and pride that Jesus ultimately wanted to crush so they would come to know his grace, his identity, and ultimately turn to him. And so he challenges them in Luke 14, 15 down through 24 to seek him first, to put the priority of his kingdom above their own thoughts. And we need this lesson tonight as well, because there's a temptation as we read this text to have the same self-righteous smug that Jesus often condemned in the Pharisees. We live in a world right now with this sort of casual flippancy towards spiritual things, and Jesus challenges that. We live and worship with people who nod in agreement with this statement in Matthew 6, about seeking first the kingdom of God, but if we're honest, we know, even in our own hearts, that so often, that's not the case. There are things, events, and hobbies that often come before the kingdom. And as the Pharisees were assured of their place in the eternal kingdom, and Jesus is about to teach and say, not so fast, think again. We should search our own hearts as well to be sure that we don't assume. But that instead, we look at what he says about prioritizing his kingdom and spiritual things and putting him first. Verse 15 says, when one of them which reclined with him at the table heard these things, he says, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to them, a certain man made a great banquet and invited many. And when the time for the banquet came, he sent one of his servants to those that were invited. And he said, come, all things are ready. And they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said, I bought a field and I must go to see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant went, and he reported all of these things to his master. When the master of the house heard these things, he was angry. And he said to his servant, go quickly into the streets and lanes and bring in the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. And the servant says, sir, what you've commanded has been done, and still there's room. And the master said to the servant, go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men which were invited will taste of my banquet. Tonight in our time together, I want to look briefly at five things that Jesus teaches us in this text 
that will hopefully help us to destroy the spirit of indifference in our own lives and also to help others to do the same. Let's begin. Number one, there is the inheriting of the greatest blessing. So after Jesus had talked about this need to welcome in outsiders, and then in verse 14, he says, you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the just. One of the men, which is sitting at the table in verse 15, he just blurts out an exclamation, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, there are several reasons why he might have said something like this. Maybe he said it in connection with what Jesus has said in verse 14, or perhaps Jesus's words are making them so uncomfortable, he just wants to change the subject. Jesus was known to say hard things. The man's words are right, but I don't know if his heart's in the right place. In these words, in verse 15, there's this underlying assumption that he, the man that says these words, and the other Pharisees that surround the table, that they'll be in the kingdom of God, but momentarily we'll see that may not be the case. Throughout Jesus's earthly ministry, people were always making statements like this, and Jesus was willing to affirm the truthfulness of the statement while also challenge the place where it came from. And so in Luke 11, in verse 28, a woman says to Jesus on one occasion, Bless is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. And Jesus just transitions and says, No, rather, blessed are those that hear the word of God and keep it. This man and the other Pharisees assume that they'll inherit the greatest blessing and be in God's kingdom. But have they really prepared themselves? Are their hearts really in the right place so that that might be true of them? Jesus is going to pivot and challenge them in this very regard. Inheriting the greatest blessing of being in God's kingdom is something that every individual that claims to be spiritual, that claims to be a Christian, ultimately desires. But it's more than just what we say with our mouths. It's ultimately involving what we say with our lives and how we live. The Pharisees often claim this faithfulness to God merely because their family lineage lined up with individuals like Abraham and David and Moses. John 8, 39, they say to Jesus, we have Abraham as our father, but their lives reflected otherwise. And so you would have statements like John the Immerser in Luke 3 and verse 8. He'd say, don't say that you have Abraham as your father, for I say to you, God is able from these stones to raise up descendants unto Abraham. That's not enough. That won't save you. His statement is true. Everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God will be blessed. The question for him and the question for us is, will we be among that number? Jesus would often say things to his disciples about their future presence in the eternal kingdom of God. Luke 22 and verse 30, he says, you'll be in the kingdom sitting on thrones and reigning. And what a privilege that'll be. But we first have to make it. This might surprise you, but in a Pew Research study from November of 2019, 73%, that's almost three-fourths of Americans say they believe in heaven in some way, shape, or form. They believe in heaven. Now, that's surprising in a culture that wants to push religion and any thought of God to the margins. Almost unanimous agreement among people in our culture and in our country. They say, yes, we still believe in heaven. But then when you read further into the study, things aren't as cohesive. Because some of those that claim to believe in heaven say, well, you don't have to believe in God to go to heaven. You still go. You can be an agnostic or an unbeliever. Even some who checked Christian as they filled out the survey said other faiths all lead to the same place, to the same heaven. You see, everybody in that 73 percent, a great majority of them would say, blessed is everyone that will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But their view of it and Jesus's view of it were two different things. Jesus would say in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, we've prophesied and cast out demons and done many wonderful works. And I'll say to them, depart from me, you which practice lawlessness, for I never knew you. Our world needs this lesson. The religiously moderate person who says, religion's a great thing, but I really don't have time for it in this moment. They need to know. And they might even exclaim, blessed is everyone that would eat bread in the kingdom of God. But in that disposition, they won't make it. Those of us who sing, won't it be wonderful there? And when we all get to heaven, need to make sure we're doing what's necessary so that it will be wonderful there, and that, so that we will get to heaven. Because Jesus talks about pressing into this narrow gate in this difficult way. And we need to be sure that that's true of us. Many people will be surprised on the day of judgment to find out that the church directory and the book of life are not synonymous. It is true that one must be a member of the church in order to be pleasing to God at an accountable age and go to heaven. But many people have long since their baptism walked away from the gospel. They professed and initially obeyed. And the New Testament says there's so much more 
Baptism is where the Christian life begins. It's where the gun blasts to start the Christian race. It is far from the end. And so those of us who claim to be Christians and walking in the light of Jesus Christ, we need this reminder as well. In order to inherit the greatest blessing, it involves being invested in the greatest cause. Sowing to the Spirit, Galatians 6 and verse 9. And this Pharisee, this man and his contemporaries, they need to know this lesson as well. Now here's number two. There's the invitation that's extended. Based on his words in verse 15, Jesus launches into a parable. There's a contrast. But he said, that's Jesus, a man once made a great banquet, and he invited many. And when the time for the banquet came, you remember he sent out a servant and said to those that were invited, all things are ready, come to the feast. Now, it was the typical practice of that time to send out one invitation at the first to let individuals know that there would be a feast, Esther 5 and verse 8. And then there would be another one to talk about the specific time, and now things are ready, Esther 6 and verse 14. She initially invites Haman and King Xerxes to the feast, and then in Esther 6, 14, this is the time for those festivities to begin. In this parable, the people that are listening to Jesus would know that these men who are being invited in verse 17 had already previously agreed to be present. The invitation from heaven was extended toward them. Jesus is telling this parable to people with a Jewish lineage and background. The invitation for them was the Old Testament scriptures. God had communicated to them. You remember what Paul said in Romans 3, 1 and 2? In what way do the Jews have an advantage in every way? Because to them was committed the oracles of God. Paul says they were given the doctrine and the covenants and the worship and the practices. Romans 9, 4 and 5. God had loaded Israel down with promises and blessings. And they had let him down continually through their refusal to comply. And Jesus is saying, there's been an invitation extended to you as children of God. God has welcomed you in. You see, the Pharisees missed it. As Jesus is in their midst, they're thinking of an eternal kingdom of God that's going to come at the future end of time, sort of an end of the world idea. But Luke, like many of the other gospel writers, drives home this one reality. With Jesus' advent into the world, the kingdom of God was already in their midst. Throughout the Gospel of Luke, run the references on the phrase, the kingdom of God, and be impressed with this reality, that there is an already and not yet aspect of the kingdom. And what Jesus wanted them to see is the invitations for the eternal kingdom have already been present in the messages you've received from others. And so in Luke 4 and verse 43, Jesus would say, I've come to preach to you the kingdom of God. In Luke 9, 27, he would say, some of you that stand here, you won't taste of death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. In Luke 10 and verse 9, he sent his disciples out to preach what we call the limited commission. And what did they preach? They preached the kingdom of God. He said, don't look for it with observation. Don't say it's here or it's there. The kingdom of God is in your midst. Luke 17, 20 through 21, the invitation was already extended. It was up to them to accept. In verse 17, he says, all things are ready. Come to the feast, we sing. It was a great banquet. It was a great feast. What made it great was the great God who had been preparing this from eternity's past, getting his people ready for what Paul calls the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 3, 10 and 11. Listen, no Jew, if God would have handwritten them an invitation to come into the eternal kingdom, would have ever turned God down. They wouldn't have done that. But God didn't send them a handwritten invitation. He didn't even send a messenger. God sent them the Messiah. He came in flesh and blood to them and said, I'm inviting you to the kingdom. Imagine waiting for something your entire life and then it finally shows up and you just sort of wave it off with a hand. Imagine thinking that you have RSVP'd for that which you really have not made preparations for. It's sort of like preparing a text message in response to somebody and you think that you hit sent, and then the next day they say, hey, what happened? And you say, I typed out this long message. I prepared this great, this great response, and you never hit sin. The Pharisees think they, they're ready. They think they're prepared. They think that they've laid the foundation. And Jesus is in front of them, and he's saying, there's been an invitation extended, and all things are ready. You know, the invitation is still extended today to people. God is still calling people through the gospel to turn to him, to respond to him in the right way, and to turn to him so that they might be saved. When the gospel is preached, God is saying to humanity, all things are ready. Come to the feast. 
when we invite our friends and our loved ones to worship service. And sometimes with a casual spirit of indifference, they say, not now, but maybe next Sunday. The spirit is saying, all things are ready. Come to the feast. When individuals just walk by through bookstores and they see copies of God's word on rack after rack, God is saying to us, all things are ready. Would you open up and read? Come to the feast. And the Pharisees, they thought they read their titles clear. They thought they were prepared. They were ready. And Jesus is saying, I've extended to you invitations, but you haven't responded. They just knew that they were shoe-ins for the kingdom, but their lives showed otherwise. It's like high school basketball players coming back for their senior year and maybe just assuming, look, we've been, we've been juniors. We played last year. This year, we know we'll make the team. Not only will we make the team, we'll be captains. And so when it's time for the tryouts, they show up late to practice. They just sort of lollygag through the drills, just going through the motions. After all, these tryouts are merely a formality, only for the day to come when the roster's printed. And not only are they not captains, they haven't made the team at all. Jesus says in Luke 13, 26 and 27, the day will come when you'll say, you hid in our streets, you preached in our villages. And I'll say to you, I don't know you. Depart from me, you wish practice lawlessness. There is a need to RSVP in response to the invitation that Jesus makes to the whole world to respond to Jesus in the right way so that we don't miss out and we don't forfeit our invitation. You know, this phrase that we use sometimes for parties or for events, RSVP, it comes from a French phrase. It's an acronym. It's an initialism for a French phrase, which means respond promptly or please respond. And we sort of upgraded it. And now you may even see this on invitations. It may say RSVP, regrets only. That is to say the only people that need to respond to this are the people that are not coming. RSVP, regrets only. If you don't respond, we'll just assume you're coming. Heaven sends out invitations. And God wants us to RSVP. You know, if you receive an invitation to something from a family member or a friend, you might reason within yourself and say, well, I'm her grandmother. She knows I'm coming. I don't have to RSVP. You might say, I'm her best friend. I don't have to RSVP. I know I'm going to be there. They know I'm going to be there. They'll count me whether I send in anything or not. No one is on good enough terms with God not to RSVP and respond to the invitation. No one can say, well, God's just going to welcome me. He knows I'll be there. We need to respond to him in the right way. The old adage from Matthew 25 and verse 34, which says, God has prepared heaven for us from eternity's past stands true. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Are we making preparation? Are we receiving his invitation? Or are we like the Jews, spurning our opportunity to do so? Jesus says, a certain man made a great banquet. He invited many individuals. and He said, all things are ready. Here's number three. The innumerable excuses offered. Jesus says the feast is ready and so are the excuses on the lips of the three men that have previously agreed to come and that have been invited. You know, I think it was Billy Sunday who said an excuse is the skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. When you really don't intend to do a thing, you can make up whatever excuse you want. That's what these men do. One by one, the text says, or all alike the ESV has, the old King James has, with one consent, they all together begin to make excuses about why they can't attend. Would you look at the text again and notice the ridiculousness, the absurdity of their excuses as Jesus tries to lay this out so that we don't miss it and so that the Pharisees wouldn't miss it as he dined with them. The first man says, I bought a field and I have to go and see it. Please have me excused. Now, you might wonder, why would he buy the field and then later go and see it? But that's the point. It doesn't have to make sense. One excuse is as good as another when you don't intend to do a thing anyway. The second man said, I bought five yoke of oxen. and I must go and examine them. Please have me excused. He's already bought the oxen, but now he wants to go and test them. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have to. Please have me excused. The third man, with each excuse, their refusal and their denial becomes more aggressive. The third man simply says, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Say no more, right? He says, I'm not coming. Now listen, the old law gave provision. Deuteronomy 20 and verse 7, Deuteronomy 24 and verse 5 gave provision for a man to have a year off from going to war in the event that he was married. But that said nothing about festal gatherings like this one. He says, have me excused. 
we might look at their excuses as absurd and foolish, but don't you know God looks at ours the same way? Our excuses aren't any better than theirs. In the end, all these men were saying is there is something more important to me than this banquet, and I don't plan on being there. Because in reality, what we really desire and what we really want to do always wins. What we really put as first place in our lives is always the thing that comes in first place. Now, here's the scary part. What often wins in our hearts is not synonymous with what we say is in first place to us. And so Jesus challenges us. Because it's easy to say the kingdom comes first, but whatever you and I will put into the blank and follow with, please have me excused. He looks on it with the same disgust and disappointment because it's just as bad as their excuses. In Romans 10 and verse 21, Paul quotes from Isaiah 65 and verse 2 where God says, All day long I've stretched forth my hands to a disobedient, a gang-saying people, people that weren't interested in me. And they all have excuses about why they can't put me first, about why other things are important. And that's what these men do. They're too busy. In Luke chapter 9, if you turn your Bible to Luke 9, hold your hand in Luke 14 and go over to Luke 9 and see how Jesus challenges people throughout his earthly ministry for first place. This is a theme that runs throughout Luke's gospel that Jesus won't come in second place to anything or any cause. And so in Luke 9, 57, there's a man who speaks up and he says, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, the foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He says to another, follow me. And this man says, first, let me go and bury my father. Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. You go and preach the kingdom of God. And then a third says, I'll follow you, but let me bid them farewell, which are at my house. Jesus says, no man, in verse 62, having put in his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. In summary, what Jesus says to these individuals and what he says to us is when it comes to the kingdom of God, if there is anything in your life more important than it, you have my permission to go and do that, those things, but I won't be your part-time Lord. I will not split time with you and your other affections. If that means more to you, then you should do this. Because what matters in the kingdom is of so much importance that it's going to take everything you have. They all with one consent begin to make excuse. They can't attend. They can't come. Tim Thomas did it in 2012 when Barack Obama was president, followed by Steph Curry in 2017 and Tom Brady in 2017 when he played for the New England Patriots. They all did the same thing. When their teams won their championship in their respective sport, they all declined to go to the White House and meet the president, as is the custom in our country, for different reasons. Some personal, some political, but for one reason or another, they declined to go. They said, you know what? I can enjoy the victory of this championship without the additional festivities of going to the White House and meeting the president. I just don't have to do it. It doesn't add anything to the win. And I suppose in politics and in sports to each his own, but in the kingdom, if we believe that we will enjoy eternity around God's table and fellowship with him while we dishonor the one that is ultimately hosting the meal, John 14, 6 says it won't happen. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4 and verse 12. That's more than an acknowledgement we make before somebody dunks us in water. It's about what we do with our lives. And so just like their excuses, we have them. All things are ready. Come to the feast. I can't come there. Why not? Well, there are hypocrites there. I can't come. All things are ready. Come to the feast. I won't be coming because somebody I looked up to that's sitting around that table let me down once, and I'm just not over it. I'm not coming. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Only after so-and-so apologizes to me first, I won't be coming. All things are ready. Come to the feast. I'm working on retirement, but once I get it stocked, once the 401k is set, I'll be at the dinner. All things are ready. Come to the feast. One more degree, and I promise after this one, he'll get everything I've got. All things are ready. Come to the feast. I've got to get my children raised, and I'm really not in the best of health, and on and on we can go with our excuses, and we all with one consent on occasion, don't we? We make excuse. The Pharisees would read passages like Isaiah 25, 6 through 9, about the eschatological banquet that would take place at the end of days, and they were assured of their seat. And Jesus is saying, don't you hear yourselves? The Messiah has shown up. What God has long prepared is here. And you're making excuses for your absence. Paul challenges us, doesn't he? 
because he was a man who it seemed from the time of his immersion in baptism never looked for an excused absence in service of God. Instead, he exercised himself with diligence in serving God. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. I don't fight as one who boxes against the air, but I keep my body and bring it under subjection, lest that by any means, after I preach to others, I would be a castaway. I haven't attained it, but I follow after because God has apprehended or laid hold of me in Christ Jesus, and I've laid hold of him, and I'm pressing toward the mark. No excuses, but an exertion of effort to the glory of Almighty God. They all made excuses about why they couldn't be there and what they couldn't do, and Jesus challenges them, and he says, you can offer up your excuses, but they all ring hollow in the ears of the divine. Number four, there's the indifferent exchange for the interested. All things are ready. Come to the feast. They all, with one consent, begin to make an excuse. And what follows next is both surprising and shocking. The master doesn't, as you might assume, he's angry. When this servant comes back with three excuses instead of three attendees, he's, he's furious. This feast has been prepared, but here's what he doesn't do. He doesn't cancel the feast. Neither does he send the servant back out to ask those who had previously been invited to reconsider. He doesn't do that. The text says instead what he does as he says to a servant, you go quickly. Go into the streets and the lanes and you bring in the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. The servant does it. He says, sir, I've done what you've commanded and still there's room. He says, go to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full. He doesn't stop the show. Instead, he says, you go find other people that are interested. You know, they had heard this before. Jesus had taught them this before. He said on one occasion in Matthew 21, John came preaching the way of repentance and the prostitutes and the tax collectors believed. And you, after it, when you saw it, you wouldn't. I tell you, they enter into the kingdom before you. Jesus says, somebody will take your seat. Here's the challenging thing about what Jesus teaches here. It is, as these individuals don't want to respond, there are other individuals that do. There are at least two ideas being communicated by Jesus here in this text. The first one is the Jewish riffraff of society are being brought in. The Pharisees at this great banquet are the spiritual and social elite. And Jesus says, if you don't want me as your Messiah, I still will reign. You go out and find other individuals who are interested. He often was with tax collectors and sinners because they were interested in what he was offering. And the Pharisees who thought they had no need, Jesus says, well, we're just going without you. But then there's a second aspect to this. He says, going to the highways and hedges, possibly speaking of the Gentiles. Now, listen, the gospel was for the Jews first, Romans 1, 16. Peter said in his second sermon in Acts 3 and verse 26, the gospel was to go to you first, but once they didn't receive it, God turns to the Gentiles. The book of Acts begins with the gospel going to the Jews and them responding. But as you make your way through the book of Acts, the Jews seem to respond less and less and the Gentiles more and more. So that Paul ends the book in verse 28 of chapter 28 by saying, if you don't want the gospel, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. What Jesus describes in this parable is what the prophets had extolled throughout the centuries. That there would be a time when those that are considered outcasts would be welcomed into the presence of God. Isaiah 29, 18 and 19 spoke about the lame and the blind being welcomed in. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6, the blind would see and the lame would leap. In Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, the prophet details in expository fashion the mission of Jesus to call those that are lame and broken spirited and that he would look out for the poor. And he says, I want them all in. Now, would you draw an arrow in your Bible from this verse back up to verse 13? Because that's the group that Jesus had just told them moments before that they needed to be welcoming. He says, these individuals that you want nothing to do with, I want you to know that if you don't receive me, they will. And they'll be at my table. Wanda Dench and Jamal Hinton had no history together until she accidentally texted his phone. And she said, I'll see you at Thanksgiving. He said, who is this? She said, it's your grandmother. He said, you're not my grandmother. She said, yes, I am. He said, would you send me a picture? He sent one. He said, you're not my grandmother. He sent a picture back. She said, oops, sorry about that. His response, can I still get that plate though? <laughs> she said, yes, because that's what grandmothers do. And they've been eating Thanksgiving together ever since. Even up until last year when their late husband passed away, Netflix has signed them up for this series that they're going to run on this accidental exchange that put Jamal at her table. I love verse 23. Luke says, 
Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Some have to be compelled. This word really carries the idea as to force somebody. But here it means to urgently invite them to come in. Don't you know that there are people that we preach to and we say something about the plan of salvation and they say, I can't believe it. After all I've done, are you sure he's going to welcome me? And we say, all things are ready. We talk to people and we say, you know, the gospel is for all. And they say, now listen, I'm from the streets. I don't know if I fit into your religiosity. I don't know. All things are ready. You're welcome. Come to the feast. Now, preacher, listen, I don't read really good and I'm not educated. And I don't know a lot of Bible and I don't know Greek or Hebrew. All things are ready. Come to the feast. You don't know what I've done. You don't know my background. You don't know my past. I don't know if I can sit at that table. The master says, compel them to come in because they're welcome here. Heaven's response is all things are ready. Those who believe on me, I will in no wise cast out. John 6, 37, Jesus says they can come. It's a note for us in our evangelism to reach out far and wide, but don't neglect those individuals who have a track record throughout the history of God's working as responding favorably to him. James 2 and verse 5, has not God chosen those that are poor in the world, rich in faith, to be heirs to the kingdom? It doesn't mean that God has a favorite among different tax brackets. It just means that certain people tend to be more spiritually inclined than others. And Jesus says, I'll see you at dinner. These individuals are present because they responded favorably to the invitation. Jesus exchanges. He says, you have a place. I don't know if you've ever played musical chairs before, but the way musical chairs works is you just walk around those chairs until the music stops. There are more people than chairs, and if you luck up, you've got to see. It really isn't about skill. It's just about being in the right place at the right time. Concerning the kingdom of God, if you or I find ourselves in a seat at the eternal kingdom, it won't be by accident. It'll be because we have put ourselves in those seats during the earthly kingdom as we've responded to the proclamation of the gospel and lived in view of eternity. Jesus says, compel them to come in so that my house may be full. Now, here's the last thing tonight. Number five, the indifferent are rejected. I believe here the parable ends because the you here in verse 24 is in the plural. Throughout the parable, Jesus has been speaking between servant and master in the singular. And it appears now that Jesus looks at those around the table and he says, for I say to you all, that none of those which were invited will taste of my banquet either way. Jesus shocks them. He says, you won't be there. Throughout his ministry, he had highlighted the faith of Gentiles. Matthew 8 and verse 11, many will come from the east and west and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the sons of this kingdom, that is the people of Israel, they'll be cast into outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He says to these individuals, you will not eat of my banquet. If you don't receive me now, you won't sit with me then. He sits at their table and he says, one day, if you don't respond properly, if you keep this spirit of indifference and disregard for the things of me, you won't sit at my table. It's a word of warning for everybody in our world who has a habit of telling God, no, not right now, that one day their time will run out and they will find out that they got their timing eternally wrong. The blessed will ever be with the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. But those who refuse to respond to the gospel will be eternally separated from God. Now, nobody to blame but themselves. Jesus could have said in verse 24, For I say to you that none of those who rejected me will find a place at my table. But he didn't say that. He could have said none of those men who didn't show up will have a place there. He doesn't say that. He uses the same word that he used previously in verse 16 and verse 17. None of those which were invited will partake of this. That is to put it back on them to say, when you find yourself on the outside, my love and my kindness will not be on trial, but your carelessness and your apathy has condemned you. You were invited, he says. None of those men which were invited will be here. Why? Because God wants them out? No, it's because they ultimately didn't want in. They'll be turned away and it'll be forever so. And so he's saying to these Pharisees, if you don't want this to be our last meal together, If you want to be present in the eternal kingdom of God, here I am. And he says the same thing to us, that we need to respond to him with the right heart and with the right spirit and reject this spirit of indifference. What we see here is a pattern that runs throughout Luke's gospel. The people that you don't think will believe, they do. And the ones you expect to, they don't. It's Zechariah, the faithful priest who's doubtful about God's promise. But Mary says, as as he said to the servant of the Lord, so let it be. 
It's the pattern in Luke 18 when the two men go up to pray, and you would assume that the tax collector would have his wording off, but he's penitent. And the Pharisee boastful. It's the Pharisee at Simon's house in Luke 7. And his heart is hard, but the woman is penitent. And Jesus says, that's what true repentance looks like. It's a pattern that Jesus is teaching that we need to have the spirit of the spiritual underdog, who, which says, I have nothing to recommend myself to God. If the gates of heaven ever swing open for me, it'll be because of what Jesus has done. And I'm not indifferent toward that fact. I don't walk or jog, but I sprint toward the kingdom of God with all of my might because I want to be accepted with him. You and I read Luke 14, 15 through 24, and we can't believe the Pharisees missed it, but there's a word of warning for you and for me. Luke says in this passage to you and to me, don't assume your presence in the kingdom of God, but assure your presence in the kingdom of God. Obey the gospel, absolutely, but that's just the beginning. Add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, and brotherly kindness, and love. If these things abound in you, you'll never fall. Your calling and election will be sure. Don't assume, assure your presence in the kingdom of God. Don't guess about it, but make reservations. Luke says, don't continue to deny him because death is sure. And life is short. And one day there'll be no more songs, no more prayers, no more opportunities to repent or really get serious about spiritual things. One day, the door to the feast will be closed. Luke says, don't pride yourself on having all the doctrinal boxes checked and having all these things right and noticing all the things that they have wrong. He says, that's not enough. It's not enough to pride yourself on how much more theologically accurate you are than others. You've got to pursue God with all of your might. The Pharisees could have been walking concordances, but they rejected the Christ. He says, you need to respond properly to me. And then he gives us a word of hope. And Luke 14, as he says, you know, there are some that are disinterested. And as we see the secularization in our society, we may become disheartened. But he says, would you find your way to the highways and hedges? Would you find your way to the streets and the lanes and compel them to come in? Some people hear the gospel and they believe it's too good to be true. And it's our job to convince them it's not too good to be true. It's just true. John Antiochus was not famous because he was once the CEO of Blockbuster. No, he's famous because when he was the CEO of Blockbuster, Netflix offered the company to him for $50 million. And he, he laughed him to scorn. He said it was a joke. He actually said, and I quote, the dot-com hysteria will soon die down. In 2010, Blockbuster filed for bankruptcy. In 2014, they closed their last corporate office. Today, Netflix is worth several hundred billion dollars. It was a mistake made by a man who didn't know the future, who did what he thought was right with the knowledge that he had, and he's forever remembered for his blunder. Jesus sits at the table as the eternal God who can see the future, and he says, put all your eggs in my eternal basket. Don't miss this. And if you do this properly, you will say on the day of judgment with assurance and with gladness, blessed is everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God.